So as you can see, this is titled Surviving the Zam Zam. That was the original title. I thought, I thought, well, I better say and much more because there's more to this. So a little background. Well, actually, Michelle did a nice job on the first two. Just a couple other things. I'm the editor of the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics, author of The Joy of Freedom and Economist Odyssey, co-author of Making Great Decisions in Business and Life, and co-author of the essential UCLA School of Economics, a book that just came out a couple of months ago. So that's a little background. Now background on my talk. When I was in early grade school, we had show and tell. Did anyone else have that? Raise your hand if you had that. And so one of the things I used to bring to show and tell was this thing of Jane Greer on the cover, June 2nd, 1947. It's this big spread on their mission in the Belgian Congo. They were medical missionaries. He was a doctor, she was a nurse. That's the first thing I knew about this. Later on, my father told me about how their ship, the Zams, this was a long odyssey. They tried to get to Africa in 1941, and they were captured. We'll talk, that's a big part of the story. And so I knew about the capture. I knew that, but there's so much I didn't know. And, you know, I think we humans, have to fill in facts when we don't have them. It's a very natural thing, which is why we often come up with a lot of bad theories. So my theory was, well, they shot the, uh, across the bow of the boat and then everyone got out. Not quite. <laughs> we'll get there. So anyway, and then in 1992, I gave a birthday party for my father, Stan Henderson, who's the middle brother of the three. Fred was the youngest. And Fred was kind of down, at, this was in Winnipeg, and Fred was at the end of the table, one table, about 20 people there. No one was really talking to him. I'd always been fascinated about this. I wanted to learn more, and he told me a bunch of stories I hadn't known. And that led me to get a nice camera and a nice tripod, and the next summer when I went up there, I always go up to Winnipeg to go to my cottage in Northwestern Ontario. Next summer I went up there, and I interviewed Uncle Fred, and I'm so glad I did, because I learned so much more. So here's a little picture of Uncle Fred and Aunt Jamie. It says, our interned missionaries. This is from a newsletter put out by the church that they were under the auspices of to go and be medical missionaries. The church was based in Indianapolis. Now, one of the things that came about was two years ago, my cousin, their son, sent me these remembrances that my Aunt Jamie had had about her time, and I'd never seen them. She would turn out to be a pretty good writer. Unfortunately, there's not a date. I've got to remember to talk to him and try to figure, did she write this when she got back, which is kind of plausible, given the degree of specificity? Did she write it just before she died in around 1987? Hard to believe that she'd remember something 36 years earlier, but I don't know. So here's her little story that I call Love at First Jab. Our paths crossed, she and Fred, when there was a diphtheria epidemic at Steinbach, Manitoba. He, um, she and Fred grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where Fred was practicing. I was sent out by the Department of Health where I was employed as a public health nurse to assist the doctor in an inoculation program. Fred told me of his plans for Africa and asked me to marry him, which I did within the year. <laughs> then they prepared. They did due diligence. We then spent part of a year in Toronto at the School of Missions, and that's about the, the missionary part of it, and then four months in New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana, where Fred took a course in tropical medicine at Tulane Medical School, and I took a laboratory in hematology and parasitology so that we could set up a sort of laboratory in our Congo hospital. Now, I want to say a little about uh, the setting. As I mentioned, they grew up in Winnipeg. In my interview with my Uncle Fred, he said that his, his hero had been Albert Schweitzer. Now, although I did not come from a wealthy family by any means, my father and Fred did. Uh, a lot of the wealth got lost in the Depression. But anyway, he had to do a, a, an interview to go to the University of Manitoba Medical School and they thought, here's some rich kid, what's he know? And he said that his peer was Albert Schweitzer, and they go, yeah, yeah, right. And so he's very proud of the fact that he showed them. So they get on this ship, this Egyptian ship. Egypt, as far as they know, is a neutral nation. 
Canada's at war, remember that. Canada's at war. This is in March 1941, and Canada's been at war with, as long with Britain since September of 1939. But this seems to be a neutral ship. I'm going to say more about that in a few minutes. Uh, it has, it, it goes from Hoboken, New Jersey to Cape Town via Baltimore, Jamaica, Recife, Brazil. And my uncle explained Recife is pretty much the furthest east you can get in Brazil, so it's the shortest path across to Cape Town. Just over 200 passengers, mainly American, well over 100 Americans. A lot of missionaries, about 20 people with, want to go and help out with ambulances and stuff like that. So this guy, this American, is one of those people. His name's James Stewart. This is his memoir, Sinking of the Jet Zam Zam. A very entertaining writer, by the way. Um, okay, so that's, that's kind of that. And here's what my aunt says. Our ship stopped in Baltimore to pick up fertilizer. There should have been a comma there, we were told. And here's James Stewart's first impression. My first impulse on seeing the venerable tub was to tell my companion that we obviously had made a mistake, that we were at the wrong dock, but no, it was the Zam Zam. This vessel was an unwashed, infested old peroxide blonde on whose face the uplifting operation had obviously <laughs> failed. And then, this is now my aunt from her memoirs, March 20, 1941, we sailed from New Jersey in the Zam Zam, an Egyptian ship which we believed was neutral. Notice my question mark, neutral question mark. I'm going to say more about that because I'm trying to triangulate and find out what's true. So I went to a number of sources. I've read six books on the Zam Zam, five of which I have. I, I brought them along. Uh, now this is Eleanor Anderson from her book, Miracle at Sea. She's, she was an American. She was one of six kids. She was one of the older ones, I think. Uh, along with her mother, and they were going over as medical missionaries to join their, the father, her husband. There were six of them, and she wrote a memoir later called Miracle at Sea. Another troubling thought was the war. Even though the United States was not involved, Mother wondered about the safety of travel for Americans. Then she remembered that Dr. Swanson had said that the Zam Zam is a neutral Egyptian ship it would avoid the European war zone by way of South America and South Africa. Nearly 150 missionaries would be traveling in the Zam Zam. Mission boards would not be sending the missionaries on a ship they did not consider safe. <laughs> but then they noticed something. I call it blackout. Passengers were noticeably upset as the crew, with paint buckets and well-worn brushes in hand, stroked thick black paint across lounge windows, hall windows, and cabin windows, completely covering the glass surfaces. And look, they are putting black tins over the porthole windows. Lawrence, that's her brother, observed. It was obvious that the Zam Zam would be traveling blacked out, so they want to know more about that. But that is not right, many were saying. If we travel blacked out, it means we are trying to hide. We were told this is a neutral ship. Neutrals have no enemies, so why should we hide? I'm going to talk to the captain, V. Eugene, his last name was Johnson, announced. We need to know what's going on here. Passengers stood around tensely, awaiting V. Eugene's return. I'm sorry, folks, V. Eugene began, but it is bad news. Captain Smith says he has orders to travel blacked out. Orders to travel blacked out. And that's all he will say. He refuses to say who gave the orders or why. And Stewart, again, amp uh, says roughly the same thing. The news was broken to us gently that we soon would be sailing under a blackout. We'd show no lights at night and we understood that the blackout would also extend to the radio. Again, I raised the issue of neutral. Well, the Zam Zam was obviously a neutral ship, we understood by this time that we were sailing under British Admiralty orders and knew that our blackout rule was most carefully enforced. I'm leaving it as a question. I'm not, I'm a, an economist. I'm not an international lawyer. My understanding, though, well, I'll say a little more, but my understanding is if you do those things, you're kind of announcing to the world that you're not neutral. By the way, I'll have plenty of blame to put on the Zam Zam in a couple of minutes as well. In Brazil, they took on two U.S. passengers, and if it weren't for these passengers, we would have a lot fewer photos. Charles J.V. Murphy, a writer for Fortune, 
I started freelance writing for Fortune in 1983, worked closely with an editor named Dan Sullivan. I found about this only a few years ago, and Dan has died. I'm guessing he was a junior writer under this guy who was one of the major editors at Fortune. And David Sherman, a photographer for life, by the way, I blogged about this a couple of years ago, and Murphy's daughter got in touch with me. It was kind of neat. She's in her late 80s, by the way. So, yeah, so that's them. Here's Murphy sitting in his office. Here's Sherman trying to get, I guess, a good photo. And here's the German raider, Atlantis. That's the one that's going to cause trouble for them. And here's something else interesting. When this movie came out, Under Ten Flags with Van Heflin, I was about 10. I went to see it because I knew it was about the ship that sunk my aunt and uncle's boat, the Zam Zam. And why is it called Under Ten Flags? And by the way, here's the, here's the book. It's by Captain Bernhard Rogge, uh, written with Wolfgang Frank, written in the mid-1950s. It's called Under Ten Flags because here was their strategy. They would carry neutral flags, like Norwegian flag or something. They'd be going about on the sea with that kind of flag. And then as they approached, they would pull it down, put up their true colors, the swastika or whatever it was, and do their, their dirty deed. And so, I don't know, like, again, I'm not an expert. That strikes me as being illegal as hell, but I don't know. So April 17th, 1941, the Zam Zam is shelled by Atlantis. It's early in the morning. People are awakened by the shells hitting the ship. And they, they start scurrying, trying to you know, get their life jackets and so on and, and trying to get off. And here's a picture, David Sherman took it, of the ship after some damage has been done. And here's my aunt's uh, recollection. The hallways were filled with smoke and people running everywhere. When I reached, we reached our lifeboat station, we found it had been shot away. We then looked to the Edwards, that's this older couple, who said to go with them to their lifeboat. Ladders were lowered and women and children got into the boat and then some men. Did those men include my uncle? No. That's why I call this next one, swim. There was no room for Fred, and the lifeboat pulled away from the sinking Zam Zam, leaving Fred and others hanging on the ladder. Later, he jumped into the ocean and swam to our lifeboat, where he clung to the side. Others pulled him into the boat, where he helped with the rowing, as some of the Egyptian crew had no idea how to row. <laughs> uh, by the way, I don't tell this because I wanted to make sure I could get through everything, but I'm realizing I'm good on time. Um, in this, this book, this is this is one of the six people, the mother and the six little kids were out on life jackets and they were wondering, are we gonna drown? And, and one of the German boats, you know, off the, off the Atlantis approached them and they had machine guns and they thought, oh my goodness, we're gonna be machine guns. But no, that was to kill uh, sharks or whatever that, that came after. Um, okay, so they get to the Zam Zam and by the way, the crew, which was largely Egyptian, scurried for those boats, leaving passengers behind. <laughs> and so this, uh, this guy, Rogi, was pretty pissed off at some of those crew, as he says in his book. Now, oh, I didn't tell you the shelling. So what they always tried to do was aim their first shots at the communications facility on the ship. So it could not communicate what had happened, where they were, anything like that. And the reason was they didn't want to be found. What was the Atlantis' goal? To mess with the British, to just cause as many British resources as possible to be used to go after them by messing with all these merchant ships. And over their li its lifetime, they, they took down somewhere between 20 and 22 ships. That was their goal. They, if they could, they would take prisoners, but, but that's why it was so key if they were going to take prisoners that they nailed that communications thing, and they did. So because they nailed it, the people in the communications thing on the, on the Zam Zam couldn't communicate, we surrender. But what the captain did was took this little flashlight and, you know, SOS or whatever they do, 
to say surrender, so they quit shouting. I think I read in one of these things, I've read so many things, that they sent like a hundred shells and like six of them hit. Now there was a pleasant medical surprise that James Stewart finds. finds. The hospital was variously called the Tamasus or the Atlantis, was beautifully equipped even to a complete x-ray unit and the staff of surgeons seemed most competent, which was really good because this is amazing. There were over 200 passengers and a fair number of crew, so let's say 250 people. How many were killed? Zero. How many were badly injured? Three. And one of them ended up dying. Now, Sherman, this life photographer, got permission from the Germans to take a picture of the Zam Zam sinking. So here are these pictures that were later published in Life magazine. There are more than four shots. I just thought I'd show you the progress quickly. There it is. Can you see it out there? Oh, oh. so what they did, the, the German crew went over, took as much stuff as they could, including a couple hundred thousand cigarettes, and some of the people's clothing, if they could find it, brought it back, and then set some kind of charges in the ship to sink it. So there it is. It's down a little lower, a little lower, gone. Now these pictures are from life, December 15th, 1941. Anything significant happen eight days earlier? <laughs> <laughs> and yet, there's, there are very few, there's very little coverage of Pearl Harbor in here, and that tells you something about the lags in publication, right? So the, the, sh the pictures were published once they smuggled them out. Um, the Germans you know, confiscated a lot of the pictures but he managed to hide them in various toothpaste tubes, toothpaste boxes, and so on, and got them out. I went through it with my cousin. There were a lot of pictures of the men, they, uh, the way they were kept. I'll say that more in a minute. And try to identify my uncle. And the one I thought was my uncle, my cousin was pretty sure wasn't, so maybe he wasn't in the picture. Um, a key photo, and this I was talking about with you before the thing started. When the raider appeared from behind the floundering Zam Zam, in spite of the motion of the lifeboat as its bow plowed into the oncoming waves, David Sherman, the photographer, managed to get a perfect profile shot of what appeared to be an innocent black freighter flying a Norwegian flag. So even when it's doing that, it's flying the Norwegian flag, which strikes me again as illegal as hell, uh, and bearing the name Tamasus. The raider Atlantis had been captured on film for posterity. Ironically, before the year was out, it was this photograph that would seal the fate of the Atlantis and her crew. How the pics got out. This is from David Lippmann, the Atlantis, the Kriegsmarine's last Corsair. The Germans grabbed a thousand frames of Sherman's film to censor in Berlin, but he kept four rolls and a tube of toothpaste, another of shaving cream, and two boxes of surgical gauze in a missionary doctor's bag until they reached neutral Portugal. Remember, they're Americans. America is neutral. They get to go home. And now back to what I was talking about with that under 10 flags. This is a description of the film. The film depicts real life German Captain Bernhard Rogge commanding the Navy Raider Atlantis, which from May 1940 to November 41, so oh, good, I did remember roughly correctly, sank 22 Allied merchant ships. And, this, and they just, uh, and by the way, just the last sentence is interesting. Rogi was one of the few German flag rank officers who was not arrested by the Allies after the war due to his conduct as a military officer. One of the things I've learned in reading about Germany and so on, and my uncle did it, and I can hardly blame him, he's been held prisoner, which we'll get to, is calling all these people Nazis. Well, many of them were, maybe even most of them were, but not all of them were. It's one thing to be a Nazi, member of the Nazi party, another thing to be in the German military. And remember, Hitler inherited a, a military, not all of whom were Nazis. And I say this, the Zamzammers got lucky. Elder Anderson uh, says this, Captain Rogge said that had any SOS message from the Zamzam gone out, for his own safety, he would have torpedoed the Zamzam and not stayed around to pick up survivors. We were that close to death. Now, this is the Life magazine from June 2nd, once they find out. It took them something like 40 days to find out it hadn't, the people were, were alive. 
from April 17th to uh, sometime in June um, or late May. Uh, the Germans announced that Zam Zam's big oil con cargo had been contraband, legally sinkable. And again, I don't have an opinion. I don't know. But then this was really striking. This is from Under Ten Flags. On learning that there were more Americans among the Zam Zam's passengers than there had been in the Lusitania in 1916, he got the date wrong, I realized at once that the capture of this Egyptian ship could be turned to excellent account by that portion of the American press which was trying to force the United States into the war. Properly handled, the case of the Zam Zam could be made into the Lusitania story of the Second World War. So he was very lucky one person was killed. Why did Rogi think this was an enemy ship? I mean, he, he admitted he blew it. This was civilians. He blew it. So why did he think he was a, it was a, an enemy ship? Well, he, before World War II, in the late 30s, had personally good relations with Britain. And he'd been over there on some kind of event, some kind of Navy event or sailing event or something, and he looked at this certain type of ship, and this British Navy person told him, yeah, that's what we use for troop movements. He recognized that type of ship. It had been a British ship, and it been, had been sold to Egypt, and he didn't know that. And now this is from the guy, I think, in American Na U.S. Navy, I think we'd probably call him the XO, the executive officer, Ulrich Moore, who wrote his own story about it called Atlantis. And then he's trying to justify the attack. Why then, if Zam Zam was taken as a result of a mistake, did we carry on with the job and sink her? What right had we to decide her fate? What object had we in destroying a passenger ship? To us, the answer was clear cut. Egypt was a belligerent insofar as she failed to behave as a non-belligerent. Her soil provided bases and fields of maneuver for services at war with Germany. Willingly or unwillingly was another matter and didn't count. This neutral ship, in quotes, was conforming to admiralty routine instructions, was failing to comply with the stipulation that liberal, the neutral should be lit by night, and was carrying contraband. For Zam Zam's cargo, we found, by no means consisted solely of missionaries, ambulance men, and nurses. She carried besides 10,000 barrels of oil and 100 American trucks, all destined, destined for the Cape, Cape Town, and all earmarked for use by a country at war with Germany. So that's his justification. And then in Stewart's book, he gives the root of the Zam Zam and of the Dresden. Let me kind of explain. They're on the Zam Zam for a few days, and then the Zam Zam hooks up with another German ship called the Dresden to offload the passengers onto it. So you can see the route as I described. I think I missed the Miami stop. And then they go across. And then they're on the, Zam on the Dresden. They go up here and then to France. Then he has them going back to New York. You can forget about that for my aunt and uncle. <laughs> they're, uh, Canada's at war, but that's where they go. And what was it like? Awful. Crappy food, tight quarters, especially for the men. Personal hygiene, almost impossible, especially for the men. They were in this hole. I mean, I, there are some pictures in my uh, on the December 41 thing just showing how tightly they were in there. And there's some horrible stories about, you know, using latrines that they rigged and so on that I decided not to tell. <laughs> And if you've seen my other talks, you know I'm an economist who's a very strong believer in free markets, economic freedoms, freedom, and a critic of socialist central planning. Central planning generally doesn't work well at all. And here's an instance. Here's Rogi venting in his book. As we have been delayed, this is earlier than they hit the Zam Zam. As we have been delayed by our meeting with the Perla, the Osterufer had been sent off far to the south, and so the first ship we met, also four days behind schedule, was the Lloyd Liner Dresden, which after acting as supply ship for the Graf Spey, had, caught, had sought sanctuary in Santos, Brazil. I was delighted to see Captain Jaeger of the Dresden, as he was due to give us some much needed supplies 
of fresh food, but he looked unhappy as we shook hands. I'm afraid I have a disappointment for you, he said. I embarked your fresh food all right, but then I got instructions for our naval attache to hand him over to the Babatanga, although she has no cold room. Oh. Both her captain and I pointed out that with a temperature of 104 degrees, the fresh food would undoubtedly go bad in her holds, but we were simply told to obey orders. I was livid with rage. After months at sea, we were desperately in need of fresh fruit, vegetables, and potatoes. Our vitamin tablets were becoming steadily less effective, and the crew's health was suffering. The Dresden could have preserved the fruit and vegetables in perfect conditions in her cold room, but she had been prevented from doing so by a piece of bureaucratic and high-handed stupidity that merited heavy punishment. So that's another reason they weren't eating that well. And by the way, the Atlantis, I think, had the record during the war of the longest at sea without setting foot on shore. I think it was something like 600 days. Now, the Dresden dodges a blockade. So the guy in the Dresden is saying, well, we might go to the Canary Islands. We're not sure, but he's not. He's kind of partly playing his cards close to his vest, and partly he doesn't know until he gets orders from Berlin. So anyway, it turns out they're trying to run the blockade. Uh, early on May 20th, the Dresden was piloted into the German-occupied harbor of St. Jean de Luz, just inside the western edge of France. Others were weeping also, for it had just been announced that only American cities would be allowed to disembark now. All others would be taken on to Bordeaux and then to prison camps. Now, I notice my little uh, director's note here at the point about the Bismarck. Somewhere in my reading in the last month, I came across this. I spent a couple hours in the weekend trying to find it again in these books and couldn't. But someone said that the guy running the Dresden wasn't that good, but the reason they got through the blockade was the British had a bigger fish to fry called the Bismarck. And so they had been, they'd taken a number of ships and put them to find the Bismarck, which of course was sunk on May 27th. So that, that, looked, that, that hunt for them had taken place over about a week or two. So that kind of, it could explain it. I, again, I can't find the source now. At St. John de Luz, the American prisoners were separated from the Canadian, British, and prisoners of other countries at war with Germany. The Americans were then transferred off to Dresden by boat and then by bus to Biarritz. The Dresden continued north, anchoring in Bordeaux on May 23rd, with the passengers considered belligerent nationals. So now we leave the Americans and focus on the Canadians, especially my Uncle Fred and Aunt Jamie. By the way, Jamie's real name was Allison Jameson. Somehow Fred, early in their dating, started calling her Jamie. Everyone I knew knew her by the name Jamie. So this is Jamie writing about the train ride to northern Germany. We then began our, germ our journey north, crowded into compartments, and the men in another section of the train, so they were separated from the men. We began our six-day trip sitting up to Bremavorde, near Hamburg. Food was passed to us through open windows by French and German Red Cross. We had been told we would be going to a POW camp for husbands and wives. Imagine when we detrained at Bremavorde, we were told we had five minutes to say goodbye to our husbands. So guess what? They're not going to see each other again. The last I saw was Fred being marched off to I didn't know where. We 28 women and children were put into a prison van, Black Maria, and driven to the local prison in Wessermunde. No one seemed to know what to do with us. And now I'm just filling in rather than quoting lengthily. They stayed there about 10 days. Fred and the other men were taken to a POW camp. Jamie and others then traveled in prison trains, barred cells with other criminals to Bremen prison, then prisons in Hanover and Stuttgart, and they worked their way south. Finally, they got to Camp Liebenau, which had been a home for the mentally handicapped. They could look across Lake Constance to Switzerland, and they stayed there for three months. And then on to Berlin. And here's my second great moment in central planning, German edition. Finally, three months later, we were informed that we Canadians were to proceed to Berlin where arrangements would be made by the American Embassy for a return to Canada. We could scarcely believe it. Canada did not intern German women. When we arrived in Berlin, no one was there to meet us, as no one had been advised we were arriving. There we were, a group of seven Canadians and seven others, alone on the station platform. We waited and waited. 
Finally, Isabel Guernsey from Vancouver phoned the American Embassy. The third secretary of the embassy arrived and soon found accommodations for us. And by the way, one of the books that talks at length about them is this book by a Canadian author, and it's titled The Accidental Captives, the story of seven women alone in Nazi Germany. And I just came across this about two years ago when I started researching this. I, I hadn't known about it. It was written sometime like in the last 10 years. Um, okay, and I, I'll take some things from that. I call this, yes, that George Kennan. The first months in Berlin, we visited the American embassy off, often and received our relief funds through them. We made a number of friends there, including George Keenan, Cyrus Fulmer, actually Fulmer, and some of the United Press men. So I had to email my cousin and say, did she just misspell George Kennan's name? And he goes, absolutely, that was the guy. Everyone, who here doesn't know who George Kennan was, if you want a quick recap? <laughs> He later became the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union. He was X. He was the guy who wrote the long telegram in around 1950 to the State Department saying, let's not try to fight the Soviet Union, let's contain the Soviet Union. And that became U.S. policy. I think he's really, I think, one of the heroes of, of U.S. foreign policy post-war. So that guy. And my aunt knew him. And here's the thing. Like, I've been interested in this stuff since my late teens. There are about 20 years between my late teens and when my aunt died. If I'd known this, I would have been asking her all kinds of questions. As unfortunately, she died in 87 or 88. Now this picture I took from this book, and she gets it wrong. These are the seven women, and she claims that Aunt Jamie is the one on the right. No way, I recognize my aunt. Aunt Jamie's the one on the left. <laughs> I, I wrote a letter to the author telling her that, uh, did not hear back. <laughs> now, Life in Berlin. This now is from a book that I have to pay $300 if I want to buy, so I, uh, I just got it through interlibrary loan and copied a couple of pages. This is about their regular life. We saw few children five years of age. Most of them were in the Nazi youth schools, and those that were seen were in uniform. Five years old and up. So just to give you an idea, they're under house arrest, kind of, but they can roam around Berlin during the day. They just have to be back at where they're staying at night. And they have to figure out how to get food, too, which is not that easy. Um, because they had to get some kind of ration food once. Five years old and up, they wore them everywhere, at school, in the street, playing. For the whole of the Nazi movement was on the youth of Germany. They were its staunchest supporters. We knew of one German citizen who had been called before the Gestapo for having carelessly criticized the Nazi regime in the confines of his home. He had been reported by his 10-year-old son. So, uh, by the way, one of the things this really reveals is how much of a youth movement Nazism was. So if you read William Shirer's The, Decline, the um, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, he misses that, uh, but it really was a youth movement. One of the stories she tells, I just think it's fantastic. It just, I just thought it had to be retold. This is Gatormson from Saskatchewan in Canada. We also heard stories about growing discontent in northern Germany. In a small village along the Danish border, a large group of former Danish nationals had gathered in a theater. A newsreel shot of Hitler boarding a new German-built plane was flashed on the screen. As he was getting into the plane, someone in the audience shouted, Greet Hess! Remember Rudolf Hess? had escaped on a plane, crash landed in Scotland and wanted to negotiate with Britain for some kind of peace. Uh, and, um, and of course, he ended up in uh, that prison, what's the name of it, after the war? Spandau. Yeah. And by the end, he was the only prisoner there. <laughs> I remember, I think it was on Saturday Night Live, they did this thing where Hess is trying to organize a, a breakout, and he goes, breaking out tonight, pass it on. Uh, of course, there's no one to pass it on to. The film was stopped. Lights were turned on. The Gestapo demanded the identity of the person who had shot it. This just makes me so proud. They were met with silence. The show was discontinued, but the people sat for two hours singing Danish national songs. It's kind of like out of Casablanca, isn't it? <laughs> Meanwhile, back in Canada, this is from um, a newsletter of the church that had sent them on this mission. 
In the Hillcrest Church of Toronto, a new missionary group of young married women has been organized. It is named the Jamie Henderson Group. Now, where does Fred go? Fred is in Stalag XP, and here's what he wrote after once he escaped. In my capacity as camp doctor, it was my duty to get the maximum medical care for the 1,000 British internees of the camp, and the most trying times of the week were the constant discussions and bickering with the German authorities for adequate medical facilities. As I look back now, I'm amazed at how forthright we were on occasions in, quote, standing up for our rights. And this is important, as you'll see in a few minutes. And this was largely due to such great humanitarian enactments as the Geneva and Hague Conventions. Without these, we hadn't a leg to stand on, and our camp undoubtedly would have compared with the worst of concentration camps. I'm not positive about that, because I don't think they would have killed them and you know, put them in gas chambers, but certainly it would have been worse. And this was now, this next one is one of the things my uncle told me that I had no idea until he told me in 1992. Jamie gets to visit Fred. She actually gets permission to go and visit Fred. In February of 42, I wrote the commandant of Fred's camp at Tost, now Tozak, Poland, asking permission for a visit along with some of the other wives. Permission came through for five of us to visit, and through police and foreign office, we had, to, we had leave to be out of Berlin from March 2nd to 7th. Now I wonder how we had the courage or foolhardiness to venture by train in enemy territory. Youth was on our side, and our desire to see our loved ones. The next day I had a visit with Fred. What a joyful reunion that was, even though a guard was present. We had tea together and Fred kept shoving extra food to me across the table, like chocolate bars, butter, etc. I put him inside my zippered windbreaker. When I left, I was surely a different shape than when I went. Fred also handed Jamie a note with a map telling her where to go to meet a stranger with a parcel. The man who handed her the parcel worked inside the camp during the day. Apparently, when Fred's fellow internees heard I was coming, they, along with Fred, collected some Red Cross food together and packaged it. What a chance that day worker took in passing me that parcel. So she takes all the food back to Berlin and shares it with the other six Canadian women, and uh, they, they get a, a nice week out of it. And here's our other comment. Fred looked so well and was working as a doctor in the camp and has extra privileges such as walks. So Fred, and you'll, we're going to say a, few, a little more about this in a few minutes, Fred, they decide to use his skills. He's a doctor. So he's supervised by a German doctor, but he's helping deal with people in camp who are sick or, or injured or wherever. Finally, they get permission to leave. So she, she and the others leave Berlin, uh, Berlin on June 13th. They go via Stuttgart, Paris, Bordeaux, Hende in France on the border with Spain. Spain, Portugal, get to Lisbon. They board the Swedish ship Drottningholm. Of course, Sweden is neutral. Back to Canada, eh? June 29th, they arrive in New York. June 30th, Indianapolis. That's the base for the, all the missionary stuff. I guess they want to debrief for a little. And July 5th, Winnipeg. So that's her getting back. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, it was in one of the newsletters. She started going across Canada giving talks about this during the war. Now, this is the story that got me motivated to do any of this. Now, it turns out I think the story is so fascinating without this that I think I would have done it anyway. I, I would now do it even if this hadn't happened, but I was just so impressed with this. I don't know if you've ever had this where <clears throat> you hear about some older relative of yours who did something kind of heroic and you wonder whether it's true. Right? So I'm the kind of one person who wonders whether it's true. So on the, this is now transcribed from the uh, interview I did with Uncle Fred. Another story I remember my, hearing my parents tell, I think, the St. Charles Country Club is near here. This is in Winnipeg. Yes. Yes, you were a golfer, and you were thinking of joining, but you found out that they wouldn't accept Jews, and you refused to join because they discriminated against Jews. Is that true? Fred, yeah. Me, yeah, that's neat. And then this causes him to go back and remember something that I don't know if he would have remembered if I hadn't asked him. And it, I'd never heard this story. I can remember in the German prison camp, we had sick parade every morning, and the German doctor would often say to the people coming up for medical treatment, Sind Sie Jude, 
Are you a Jew? Hitler, of course, was against the Jews. I had to get the Swiss protecting power to get the German doctor to promise that he wouldn't ask whether they were Jews or not. Me, oh wow, that's, this was where? <laughs> In the, something, the German prison camp. So you actually got the German doctor not to ask that? Yeah, how'd you do that? Because the Swiss protecting power could get the German doctor to promise that. This gets back to what he said about how they have the Geneva Conventions on their side. He felt safe enough in doing that to do that. Again, this was totally new to me. And I say, in a prison camp in Germany, because I have a certain view of what that's like, yeah, that's neat. I didn't know that. I had no idea. I thought once you were in a prison camp and you were Jewish, that was it. So you just said, no, this is not right, and I'm going to protest. Fred, yeah. And you get my comment, that's wonderful. You probably saved some lives. Now, I've said zero about my father. My father was two years older than Fred. Canada had a volunteer military from 1939 to 44, so almost the whole war they fought with the volunteer military. And when I asked my father once why he joined, the, the answer he gave was that he wanted to have the experience other young men were having. He wasn't total spring chicken. He was born in 1910, so he was 32 when he joined. But still, that's kind of young, especially to us, right? <laughs> um, but here's the thing. <laughs> oh, but here's what I wonder. I wonder, did he join because they got my brother, right? <laughs> Maybe, and he never mentioned that. This is his discharge certificate. Why discharge? Well, when my father was 17, he lost most of his hearing in both ears. And I could never get the whole story about how. I often wondered if it was because of his tyrannical father, but I don't know. Anyway, he's an honest man, signs up, says, I have limited hearing in both ears. They take him on anyway, put him through basic training, and finally, after basic training, they hurt him <laughs> and kicked him out. So this is his discharge certificate. Now, In November 43, the camp in eastern Germany is transferred to a small town north of Belfort in France. Now, he didn't say why, but here's what I'm wondering. Is it because the Russians are coming? Maybe. That's getting close. As soon as we discovered on studying a map that had been smuggled into the camp that we were only 40 kilometers from the Swiss frontier, we could think of nothing but making plans to escape. There were many circumstances which favored an escape attempt at the time. First of all, we were in a newly constructed barbed wire enclosure, which had not been given the thorough once-over that only a prisoner had, to, had the patience to carry out. Nevertheless, the Germans had constructed it well. They do that, don't they? Using very large wire, much tougher than I had seen in Germany, which apparently had been obtained from the dismantling of the Maginot Line. These are from his memoirs, this written out thing my cousin gave me. Uh, that he wrote up fairly soon after all this happened. The second big factor for success was the fact of being surrounded by a friendly population of whom 80 or 90 percent would help us out should we throw ourselves on their charity. Then began a methodical study of the weaknesses of our prison walls. Two rows of wire with rolled up coils between would have to be cut through, but this could be done in one particular location hidden from the direct view of the guard on duty 30 feet away. So they get out, six of them. Then they go and they knock on a door. The escapees offered chocolate to their host. They brought the rations with them, but were told to keep it for their travels ahead. And my uncle comments, had we as British escape prisoners been found here, the penalty for assisting us would have been death. So it, those people had some guts in helping them. And as I say, they're close to the Swiss border. So they get to the frontier. We waded hip deep through a creek, crossed an open space, and hid in a ditch at the side of the road, pressing our bodies flat against the embankment as the unsuspicious representative of Hitler's Germany passed by overhead, so close that we could hear him breathing as he pushed on the pedals. He was hardly 30 to 40 feet down the road when we climbed up upon it, crossed, into, crossed the field on the other side, and put everything we had into a run that took us hundreds of yards, yards deep into Swiss territory. For the first time in almost three years, we were free from our Nazi jailers. So he gets into Switzerland. Now one thing I learned 
um, I don't know if I learned it talking to him or just the reading I did, was because Switzerland's neutral, you just can't go there and come home because then they're kind of betraying their neutrality. So you're kind of under house arrest, but it's a very gentle house arrest. And now this is from a church newsletter. Mrs. A.G. Henderson, Alfred George, was his uncle's, well, my uncle's name, called the Office of the Foreign Division of the United Society on January 11th, 44, to say that she'd had word from her government in Ottawa, Canada, that Dr. A.G. Henderson had escaped from a civilian prison camp in Belfort, France, and had reached Switzerland and was interned at Lausanne. And then later in the newsletter from January 15th, today a cablegram from Dr. Henderson direct to the United Christian Missionary Society announces that he has arrived in Vive, Switzerland and asked for, his financial, for financial guarantee. This may mean that he is no longer interned in Switzerland, but is a free man after two and a half years prison camp. And now um, here's Jamie, because she hasn't forgotten what their whole goal was. The work in our hospitals in Congo, and this is from a church newsletter still during the war, October 44, in Congo is now being carried out by three missionary nurses with the assistance of trained native helpers. The challenge and task which awaits is overwhelming. Dr. Henderson, Henderson is aware of the emergency and has cabled his willingness to go direct to Congo when the way opens. For the past few months, he's been working in a hospital in Montreux, it doesn't have an A in it, Switzerland. A way is open for him to leave Switzerland. On October 8th, I received a cable from him from overseas in which he advised me to, quote, await notification of further moves. Just where he is now is a question. And he, he may even be en route to Africa. She doesn't know. It's not like we have all these cell phones and stuff. This is from Fred's short um, memory that my, my cousin gave me. In February of 44, I was released to work as an honorary captain with the British troops who had escaped from prison camps at the time of Mussolini's downfall. From that point on, my stay in Switzerland was most enjoyable. After the liberation of France, what was like June or so of 44, we were able to be repatriated by way of southern France, Italy, and thence to the United Kingdom. But there's a hitch. After all, this is government. The Canadian government refused, they want to go back. The Canadian government refused to release doctors and nurses. So someone said, why don't you go down to Ottawa, take the train down to Ottawa and plead your case, which they did. They appealed to the medical board on May 9th, which is a very important day because it's the day after VE Day. So the Canadian government lightens up and says, okay, you can go. So they got their Belgian visas, inoculations, and supplies. They sailed from New York on August 2nd. They arrived in Dakar, Senegal, August 13th. They were there a couple of days where they heard of VJ day, VJ day. Now, for Canada and Britain, VJ Day was August 15th. For America, it was in early September. They sailed to Matadi on the Congo River, took a train to Leopoldville, and an airplane to Cockhill Hatville. And they're finally in Africa. This is a picture from Life magazine of my cousin Doug. He was born there. Let's just say he gets very used to the, the local diet. He liked the food. <laughs> and they, they wanted to get some food from, you know, the kind of food we're used to for babies, and he got used to that. But he, he really took to the place. So there's my cousin Doug. This one I like. As many of you know, I'm an economist, so I love reading about prices of things. So this, this thing on top is the little caption underneath. That's my Uncle Fred. That's my Aunt Jamie at the table. Congo Clinic is held in Native Village by Dr. Henderson while his wife mixes medicines at table. Natives flock into village where the missionaries arrive. Dr. Henderson charges $2.73 for all abdominal operations, 68 cents for maternity cases, 11 cents for tooth extractions. Now even inflation adjusted, can we have those prices? And then here's another one. What he did was he took these little uh, lamps that you might get at Woolworths and rigged them with this, this um, operating lamp, a gas lantern above and to focus the, the light on the, on the table to do surgeries. And there they are sitting around with the missionaries and so on. Uh, there's my Uncle Fred on the left, my Aunt Jamie on the right, and some of the other people. And uh, again, I'm an economist, so I love this. Henderson accepts cash or camp copper anklets in payment for treatment of natives. So they're there from um, 
45 to 1948. Um, so they left in about late August or early sem September 1948 to come back to Winnipeg. And that's my story.